So, refuge. This is a profound and far-reaching topic, and it's more useful than ever at a time when many of us very understandably, including worldwide, feel disturbed, dislocated, shaken uh, in turbulent, uncertain, unsettling times. In the Buddhist tradition, refuge is also an extremely central subject. One of the ways that people traditionally could, would identify themselves as Buddhist would be in terms of taking refuge in the three jewels in Buddhism, uh, typically described as the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. As a brief description of them, and which I'll, and I'll return to the subject a little later, the Buddha is understood as the historical figure, the teacher who had a life, made mistakes, practiced, became realized, enlightened, and then taught for another 40 years, roughly, wandering around in northern India, and whose teachings um, have benefited millions of people over the millennia since. One can also understand Buddha in terms of the meaning of the word Buddha, which is to know. The in underlying wakefulness and knowingness and goodness, and even, we could say, deep down, enlightened true nature already in all of us. So it's the teacher within. So in other words, Buddha can be the external teacher, the historical figure in whom we can have informed confidence and try out what he says, give him the benefit of the doubt maybe, check it out in our own experience, and we can take refuge in Buddha or Buddha uh, as the teacher within. Dharma means essentially the truth of things. So it's both reality itself, which is a really interesting thing to think about as a refuge, reality itself. Not good, not bad, not left, not right, not red, not blue, not up, not down, not here, not there, just reality itself. We can take a kind of refuge in that. Good. Great. Uh, somehow there was a spotlighting of somebody and then I shifted that. Okay, great. So um, another way to understand Dharma also is that it's an account of reality. We could say that the scientific tradition is one kind of an account of reality. Another um, account of reality is the Buddhist teaching tradition that um, offers ideas and methods to us that are grounded in the Buddha's own realization and his 40-year teaching career, as well as the teachings of other people that have found their way into the early surviving written record, the, the Pali canon of the early Buddhist teachings, as well as the development of Buddhism, like a mighty tree that is kind of a single set of you know, trunk and roots, but then is um, spread its branches through Tibet and China, Japan, and now in the West. So that's another way to understand Dharma and to take refuge in it, to give it a chance, to see what value it might hold. And then finally, Sangha, as the third jewel, is understood originally as the lineage of monastics and monastic teachers. These were people who in northern India 2,500 years ago would take very serious vows of poverty, celibacy, um, and were willing to live by a code called the Vinaya that had many, many rules that were developed over time to support the uh, monastic community and also to protect its ethics and to make sure it was worthy of the support of the lay followers. Uh, it's a matter of historical fact that uh, I personally think, very unfortunately, there were many more rules for uh, female monastics than there were for male monastics uh, as an example of the patriarchy of the, of the time of the Buddha and unfortunately many, many years since, including up through the present time. Uh, so that's one way to think about Sangha is it's in its vertical element. You know, so we take refuge in the practice of people who've given their lives to practice. I myself have known a number of monastics, uh, female, male, 
probably be on those categories as well. And I, I take refuge in their example, their inspiration, their dedication, their spirit. And as individuals, uh, at least the ones I've known, have been, I've learned a lot from, you know, and have been to me admirable people. And they <laughs> would be the first to say that they were flawed and still practicing and still trying to clean up their own messes. Uh, Increasingly, we can understand Sangha in its horizontal dimension as the community of fellow practitioners, the, the congregation in the very broadest sense, for example. And we can relate to Sangha in the dimension of dedicated practitioners, also outside the Buddhist tradition. Uh, I myself have uh, taken refuge in and learned greatly from a friend of mine who is a professor, a teacher of Christian contemplative practice uh, and a deep practitioner of that. Um, I've gained a lot from uh, people who've been really um, important examples for me in the native people, indigenous first people traditions of the world. We can, we can take refuge in, in this aspect of Sangha, if we choose, outside the frame of Buddhism and, and also in secular uh, aspects. And we can take refuge in its horizontal aspect broadly in just the sense of people worldwide who are trying. <laughs> you know, I think back uh, to the teaching from um, Mr. Rogers, who you know, famously talked about his own mother telling him when he was upset as a boy to look for the helpers. Look for the people who are trying. You know, these days, um, certainly related to the plague of COVID, and also more generally, I take refuge in the, the efforts of people pushing brooms late at night in the hallways. You know, people uh, still bringing groceries to our, you know, to our stores and tables, uh, to the efforts people are making, uh, to people who are supporting civil society in a variety of ways, you know, and take refuge in that and take refuge in you all. I'm seeing your faces here of so many people I know, many I don't know. I scroll through the screens here. You might want to do it right now. And even if people have their cameras off, uh, I see names that I recognize and names that I don't. It's fine. And I think, oh, wow, there's Sheila, you know, or, oh, wow, there's David camera off, right? There's iPhone. Hello, iPhone. <laughs> Hello, Sophia, right? Uh, and if you like using things like Insight Timer or other apps, you can sometimes see people who are practicing worldwide at this time. That's another form of Sangha. We can take refuge in good company and to feel supported by them. So you might want to think about in terms of these traditional refuges, where are you around with them? You know, and what might be, on the one hand, a missed opportunity for you to take refuge in, to take protection and support, inspiration, wisdom, um, pleasure uh, from, let's see again, somehow here, good. Um, and take refuge in the fact that your mind can come back to wherever you were going. I don't know, Lily, <laughs> it's not your fault. Really, it's not your fault. Something is happening with your computer. It can be randomly. I mean, honestly, the fact that this stuff works at all is amazing. Okay, so my point is, are there missed opportunities for you on the one hand for these traditional three refuges, the three jewels? Uh, in particular, I think uh, it's fair to ask, are there missed opportunities in the third jewel of community? We can take refuge in the teacher, the teaching, and the community of the Todd. And as someone who's been a major support for the development and the appreciation of community and relatedness as a field of practice and a support for practice in the Western Buddhist tradition, specifically James Barras, my friend and teacher, um, as, James, as James once commented in a, in a group that I was part of along with him to bring more community um, into the Buddhist world, he said kind of quietly but with great dignities, there are three jewels, not two. And I think that in the East, it was a very strong tradition of community, but when Buddhism moved to the West, it brought along the teacher uh, and it brought along the teaching, but it, in many ways, I think, left behind Sangha, the community of the taught. And it left the third jewel behind, and it's very important for us to make sure that we're developing it, including through vehicles like this online meeting and how I'm trying to find the sweet spot that makes room for people without it 
becoming too chaotic and, and disruptive. So um, the other question though, with regard to these three jewels, alongside, are there any missed opportunities in your practice? Are you missing out, for example, in the study of the Dharma? Are you missing out in your own openness to the teacher within? Are you missing out, uh, let's say in terms of Sangha, in you know, opportunities to spend time with monastics or uh, with really dedicated practitioners, serious teachers, uh, in conversation with them or reading their books or you know, watching their videos, listening to their guided practices in the Buddhist tradition and outside this tradition. So are, are you missing out in any way on the one hand? On the other hand, it's fair to ask ourselves, are we going too far with any one of these? Are we being too credulous about the teacher? We can err in that direction. Are we um, thingifying the aspect of ourselves that is spacious and can feel transpersonal? Are we turning it into a thing that then we cling to? Are we becoming overly um, credulous about the Dharma, the teaching? You know, are we holding on to certain fixed ideas uh, about anything you know, in the Dharma? And are we getting into trouble with our identification with or involvement with some um, subset of practitioners? I myself, outside of Buddhism, have been in, I would say, half a cult uh, in my 20s, and I've brushed up against uh, cultic features of some other things that are problematic. So I think it's fair to ask ourselves both ways, you know? Are we um, underutilizing some, you know, key resources, key refuges in terms of the three jewels? And on the other side of it, are we maybe going a little too far, being a little too carried away? Uh, balance, right? The middle way. So with that as a bit of a background, a kind of a Buddhist entry into this topic uh, and a setup for an exploration that I hope to have with you over weeks to come, because for, for its own sake, uh, refuge is a profound and useful subject. And I think that in turbulent times, which uh, I don't think are going to end uh, anytime soon, uh, certainly not next week, maybe not next month either, uh, during turbulent times, it's especially useful to have some sense of refuge. So I invite you now to just think about refuge in a very homely, down-to-earth way. Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, teacher, teaching, community of taught. You know, it can feel sort of exotic and uh, am I doing it right? Bring it down to earth. As you move through your day, what gives you protection, comfort, refueling, inspiration, replenishment? What, sorry, what are your oases, your pit stops <laughs> as you move through your day? In simple ways. So I'll mention some of mine and you might think about some of yours. Uh, feel really free, by the way, in the chat to just, if you like, make comments. Other people will see. They don't have to look if they don't want. If you want to turn off the chat feature so you don't see it, just slide the screen so that part is out of view or just close it all together. Um, you can do that. So as I wake up, you know, uh, coffee. <laughs> is I take refuge in my coffee. I take refuge in the vitamins, you know, I take first thing in the morning. Um, I take refuge in uh, our daughter who's living with us now and her cat when she comes out of her room and I get to greet her in the morning. I take refuge when I get to see my wife. Um, we have different things that give us refuge. I look out the window, I see the, the beauty of the land. Um, I put on some music, I get some breakfast. I move through my day. That's just the beginning of a day. And, you know, I have a fortunate life in some ways, but wherever we are, uh, you know, I uh, spent a little bit of time in India and I definitely spent uh, time in Haiti and other places in the world. And it's striking the way in, in the ways in which um, the worse it gets, actually, 
the more important it is to find refuge in the middle of our everyday life, in perhaps morning prayers, in that first glass of water, in making it to the bathroom, you know, what do we take refuge in? And then also think about your childhood. What did you take refuge in there? For myself, I've been reflecting a bit about my own background and I took refuge in the sense of the wilderness or the outdoors around my home. I grew up in suburban developments in um, Southern California on the edge of orange groves and actually with housing projects and malls and so forth that were laid on top of orange groves that had been there. I took refuge in the shoots of orange trees that still stubbornly and persistently wanted to break through the manicured dichondra lawns of various people or the cracks in the sidewalk. I took refuge in the groves that still existed around our, our neighborhood and in the rolling California foothills that extended further. That was a key refuge for me. It was quiet there. Nobody was supervising me. Nobody was criticizing me. It was refuge. Another refuge for me, and I'm just speaking of some of my own to kind of bring it down to earth, to make it homely and grounded and real. Another refuge for me was reading. Uh, to be able to sneak under the covers at night uh, with my flashlight when my parents didn't know and read. Uh, to be able to discover when I was probably, by the time I was seven, maybe, six or seven, science fiction of different kinds. A kind of a orderly world, unlike my kind of chaotic family and school situation. Um, an orderly world where you could figure stuff out. And if you just persisted, you could discover reality. It wasn't always kind of changing and strange. And you could make it better. And you could imagine yourself as that kind of a person. You didn't have a chance yet as a six or eight or 13 year old to be that kind of person, but you could hold on to and take refuge in that vision of the possible. I also took refuge in other people. We had pets. Um, my, my parents were very loving and decent people. Um, I had friends, you know, I took refuge in them. Um, I took refuge as well in my own capacity to think. You know, I don't know if you've uh, read the books at Hartha. I actually read it while I was in the hospital uh, after an operation when I was um, uh, 17. And it was very surreal to read Siddhartha uh, in the hospital. And uh, one of the things I recall from that book is that when the young Buddha figure before his own enlightenment came back from his ascetic practices in the book, which is very loosely related to the historical Buddha's own life, he came back from um, his practices, uh, which he almost starved to death in and were frustrating and didn't quite do it for him. So in the book, he actually returns to the householder life, which the historical Buddha did not do. Um, and then the Siddhartha figure goes to work for this merchant, you know, a grain merchant who recognizes that this kid, you know, this young guy in his early 20s, uh, you know, has some kind of game, right? He has some qualities, but the, the merchant's trying to figure out what can I, what can you do? So we asked him a bunch of questions, you know, can you sell grain? Uh, no, I have no idea. Can you haul heavy loads many hours in a day? Eh, probably not. Um, can you operate a boat? Can you, you know, manage ox carts? No, 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 no. Finally, the merchant bursts out and asks Siddhartha, what can you do? And Siddhartha pauses and he says, well, I can fast. What else? The merchant asks. Siddhartha says, well, I can think. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Anything else? The Buddha pauses, Siddhartha pauses, and he goes, I can wait. I can be patient, which is one of the perfections, actually, one of the paramis in the Buddhist tradition. Patience, that capacity to endure, to know in your heart of hearts that you will be here tomorrow, that you will get through to the other side of this day, this experience, this time, and the tomorrows after that. 
So for myself, you know, I took refuge in, in the knowing that, that I could think. I could kind of slowly but surely see what was really going on and slowly but surely figure it out. So I invite you yourself to think about some of your own refuges as a kid. Maybe in the arts, that was not my, you know, a, a particular refuge for me, even though I have a lot of respect for it. Maybe in music. Activities maybe, cooking, school. Maybe you took refuge in some key people. You know, someone who really loved you. Calling on Mr. Rogers again, as you can see in his um, Emmy acceptance um, evening, he turns to the crowd there and says, we're all here, us famous, successful, wealthy, um, you know, affluent people, we're here because someone loved us into being. Who loved you into being? Maybe that was a refuge for you as a child. People who loved you into being. Maybe your friends, the neighborhood. It's helpful to be aware of these. There might be other feelings that come up, sorrow or sadness or loss, but it can be really helpful to appreciate what fed you when you were young? What protected you? What inspired you? Who stood up for you? That's a refuge. Who befriended you? Who opened a door for you? Who gave you a helping hand? These are refuges and we can feel them. I'm naming a variety of refuges, not to make any one of them special or better or right. I'm just naming them to kind of draw you into a very down to earth and juicy sense of finding sanctuary, finding an oasis, Finding something you can count on. You know, you put your hand on the wall, it stays there. You can count on it. What is reliable, relatively reliable, relatively trustworthy, outside you and inside you? These are the refuges that we need to make our way in this, in this world of wonders. <laughs> 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows. So before we go further in this kind of overview I'm offering here, and then in the weeks to come, I'll move through key refuges, uh, both in our personal history and bring in some of my background as a therapist and a psychologist and, and attachment theory and what we understand about how we um, develop and develop strengths inside ourselves over the years and how we can help ourselves and be a friend to ourselves, no matter what has been missing around us. You know, I'll be exploring that and some other things as well as some depths uh, in the weeks to come in terms of taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha and some aspects of that. Uh, for now, in my kind of overview survey, and then I'll start moving into questions and comments. So if you have questions or comments, please start chatting them in, typing them into the chat feature. Um, we can relate to refuge in a variety of ways. One of the classic ways is to go to refuge. And I think literally, concretely, of people who in various times have needed to flee to refuge, uh, to get to the church sanctuary so that they could not be attacked by the mob, or to make it to the literal oasis where the water is uh, if they're dealing now with a drought uh, or in perhaps famine as well and now in Africa related to that. Um, so there's a sense of going to it. You think of the child who's distressed and upset, who takes refuge, who finds a secure base in hopefully in some attachment figure like a parent or other caregiver, maybe, you know, goes for a refuge with their teddy bear. Uh, that's a, you know, that's a refuge, their talisman perhaps their crystal, their sacred object. 
you know, refuge there. We go to it. Well, that's good. Uh, I've had a lot of experience in, <laughs> in wilderness and in life in different ways where I was very happy to finally make it back down before it was pitch black or make it down at all, even in stumbling around in the darkness with or without my flashlight, making it back to my tent or the car. Um, so, you know, we can go to refuge, perfectly appropriate, but it's dualistic. It's separated from us. It's out there. And you can also explore the sense of arriving in refuge already. In other words, being yourself, for example, or, or being lived by or in touch with the, the refuge of the teacher already inside you, what you know already. You can also take refuge in the teaching. Uh, there's a book by Ajahn Chah, which I think is a wonderful, excellent book called Being Dharma. Being Dharma. Ajahn Chah uh, is a teacher in the Buddhist tradition in Asia, no longer alive, teacher very much in the Western uh, Vipassana tradition. And uh, what a wonderful title, Being Dharma. You know, we're being it. We can be love already, right? We can go to love or we can be love. We can go to uh, feeling uh, of worth and capable, and also we can feel capable already. So um, you might invert it. You might think to yourself, oh, I'm resting as, or I'm abiding as the refuges that um, you, you, you aspire to, you want to su feel supported by. Okay, so that's kind of an overview, refuge. And um, one of the things that you could do um, concretely is to take refuge in something or establish yourself in the refuge of something every day. Uh, for a long time, I've taken refuge every day in multiple things, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, and some other things. You can do it in a formal way, kind of before you get out of bed maybe and just get going. Uh, you could do it at night or you could include it in a meditation you do. Um, being pretty candid here about my own formal meditation practices, um, I'll often offer three bows. Uh, one bow is to the transcendental, the divine, the infinite, the mystery. Second bow is to the Buddha uh, and the, the Buddhist lineage. And interestingly, the third bow I offer is to the various factors and forces in my personal life, including the efforts of those ricks previously that have handed off causes and conditions that can help me today. Who do you bow to? What do you bow to? What can you find refuge in? And what can you take refuge in, even in formal ways? And once you arrive in refuge, can you feel it? Can you open to it? Not just doing it as a formality, but as, as a feeling. Oh, I'm landing in the feeling of sanctuary. <sighs> you know, it's like <sighs> letting go. I'm landing in a feeling of comfort and support to the extent it's authentic for you. I'm landing in the sense of wisdom of, and I can know what I know. <sighs> right? Feeling it in a very rich, porous, and sponge-like way when you're landing in refuge. Okay. So I'm gonna take a scan. Wow, great, I love it. Thank you. Thank you for writing in some comments. Um, and I'm going to see, here we go. Um, so I'm seeing things here. Let's see, is there a question or a comment that's a um, question related to refuge? I mean, I'm definitely seeing other things in the chat, including people talking about personal losses, uh, which, you know, I feel for. Uh, do you have a 
Anybody have a question for me? Hmm. Well, maybe I can speak here in general to refuge in the midst of loss. And it's very reasonable it, when the ground disappears beneath our feet, when anything significant has happened, including the loss of a loved one. First of all, sometimes all we can do for a while is just ride out the storm. Feel it, be with it, bear it for the next minute. That's all we can do. And any effort to find refuge in this or that, it's inappropriate. We're just, we're in the middle of it. We're just, we're so full, we're awash, we're flooded. And maybe we can find some comfort or some slight easing of what's happened to just know to ourselves, you know, I can be with this, I am being with it, I can feel it, I, and, and I can take the next step. I can get through the next breath, I can get through the next action, I can get through the next day. I can go to sleep, I can wake up, I can be there for others, and I can feel and know even that even when it's the total worst, from the experience of others who've gone through the total worst, there's a process here, there's time, there's a natural progression of time. So these are some things that are just very minimal, that if they're of support for a person, we can rest in. The, the essence here is, you know, where do we find rest? Where do we find ease? Maybe meaning, what, where do we find help? These are refuges, whatever they may be for a person. And some other common keys, I can speak of loss myself, not shocking, terrible loss, you know, the natural loss of aging parents, the, I can speak about the loss of important relationships and, um, you know, ways I've, I've been treated, you know, massively unfairly in some ways. And, I can speak about that. I cannot speak from personal experience about the most grievous losses of all. I can speak from learning from and listening to people who have suffered those kind of losses or who have worked with people who have suffered those kind of losses. And so sharing some of what they offer, um, there can be the comfort and the support what helps? It's really simple. What helps? What helps? Uh, they speak of what helps, including sometimes relationships with other people who are supportive and who can understand, who are uncomplicated, not invasive, not busy. They don't rush in to fix stuff. They can just be with you. They can just listen. Uh, a very profound teacher is, is Frank Ostaseski, who founded the Zen Hospice Project, who's written a beautiful book recently, The Five Invitations. Um, he was uh, a guest, Forrest and I interviewed him recently on our Being Well podcast. Um, I think that interview is being, has been posted. His, and Frank's book, The Five Invitations, is certainly available. That's a, that's a major source of comfort. And one thing I think that Frank has pointed out that I've learned from him is to Keep it simple when you're when things are at their worst. Keep it simple for yourself and keep it simple when you're when you're with others who are themselves dealing with things at their worst. So sense of connection, uh, simple acts uh, for the body. Try to eat, try to drink water. Um, maybe you find comfort in that cup of tea. 
you know, f simple physical things, uh, make the bed in the morning, or, and also lower the demands on yourself. You know, you don't have to get it all done right now. That can be a refuge and a comfort for people. Another one is a kind of refuge or comfort in, in the knowing of your own good heart, just deep down, the good intentions you've had. You don't have to be perfect to just know the goodness, the effort, in oneself, including right now, the good heartedness in just doing the best you can with what's happening. You know, just not a false praise, not an arrogance, just a, like a, knowing you're trying, that there's love in your heart, you're, you're doing what you can. That's a kind of a classic one. And then I'll just maybe leave. Uh, with, you know, another classic refuge that I've read um, that people talk about when things are just at their worst is feeling and knowing that you still have love to give. You still have helpfulness. You, you still have contribution in the broadest sense. There's something unbroken, not quenched, not permanently stifled inside us. And there can be a fueling and a protecting and a comforting in recognizing, oh, I can still be helpful in some way, not in a way that exhausts oneself or is burdensome, but just, oh, I, I can see the good in another person. I can be kind to others. I can be compassionate to others still. You know, I can offer comfort to others still. That, that capacity in me has not been destroyed and I can take refuge in it. I can take my stand in it. It can be a place to stand among other refuges. Refuge gives us a place to stand when everything has fallen apart beneath our feet. Okay. So, good, I see. Yeah, and we can, we can take refuge and just the good intentions, you're probably hearing some background sound in my neighbors. Um, we can take refuge in the efforts of others, even their sometimes misguided efforts, well-intended but not very skillful, but still, they're well-intended efforts by others. Okay. So I'm going to mute my mic for just a second while I read the comments here. I'm going to close my window. I'll be right back. By the way, I have wonderful neighbors. <laughs> I take refuge in them too. <laughs> okay. So I want to... Um, I think open it up for um, art, actually. Uh, and art, I'm kind of picking on you because you're one of the stewards of our sitting group, our uh, now Wednesday meditations. And I'm looking for you and wonder if I can unmute you. So Art, would you be willing to ask your question with your, yep, great. Great yes. question, Art. Hello. Okay. Hi. Oh, let's we got two computers going. Sorry for the sound there. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, a simple, succinct <laughs> question. Is taking refuge ever kind of an escape, um, a not so healthy escape? Yeah. So I have a question for you, Art. Was there something in particular you were thinking of 
or was, was this more kind of abstract? So I'm going to unmute you here. So Art, are you thinking of something in particular? It's taking a moment to unmute you. Unmuting, unmuting. I don't know why. I think you might have turned off. There yeah. you are. I, yeah, I something specific. <laughs> Is there anything specific you're hmm. thinking? No, about? I can't. Put your sound up. Put your sound up. Uh, okay. Okay. No. Anything specific you're thinking of? Well, um, there are times when I take refuge in. Um, I feel like I'm spinning my wheels a little bit. I'm escaping. I'm, I'm, I'm not facing some things I need to face. Uh, it's pleasurable. Um, I'm gaining something from it, but I'm also um, leaving something behind. And, uh, yeah. and, and <coughs> danger in that. Where's the line? That's great. All right. So I'm going to mute you now, Art. That's an awesome question. Um, so I, I keep going back to the fantastic Dharma question from Dr. Phil. So how's that working for you? And that's where the Buddha took his refuge in a funny kind of way, in pragmatism, as he said to people again and again, see for yourself what's working, what's not working, what's helping, what's hurting, what's leading to a higher happiness or a lesser happiness. And that is a pragmatic reflection and there's no right answer, we continually course correct, like a bicycle, always falling over, tipping over one side or another. That's a wonderful refuge, just that, this idea of pragmatic evaluating and problem solving. Then specifically, I think you're naming the classic issue that John Wellwood talked about, wonderful psychologist and teacher no longer alive, uh, who, used, who coined the phrase spiritual bypass. And I think we have to be careful about that. Um, I think it's particularly important to be careful of our strengths because everybody loves our strengths and we're used to our strengths and so forth, but they can become a weakness because they can overtake us. So we can take refuge as I did when I was young, especially in intellect, but overuse that particular strength, which then can crowd out other things as well. So. Uh, at the net of it all, um, I think one of the deepest questions here, and it's a fundamental refuge, and I think it's a good one for us to finish on, is for you, Art, who I know personally as a very good guy and a longtime practitioner, and for all of us, and including myself, what is the highest happiness for you? What really calls your heart? and is saying to you in genuine ways that you intuitively know you should listen to, keep going, take this path, keep aiming for the heights that you know in your heart are what are most important for you in this life. That sense of prioritization. I was uh, once talking with the uh, uh, teacher Gil Fronstel about my own practice and some frustrations about being pulled in many different directions. This was about 20 years ago. And he said, well, Rick, it's a little bit like someone who's dedicated to running a marathon or training to be really strong at anything. You sometimes make choices and you let other things fall away. So something to ask for us all uh, is a question, you know, I, I ask myself too, what's the highest happiness for you? What is enlightenment for you? What is awakening for you? What is realization for you? When you're lying there, honestly, uh, when you have a year to live, a day to live, a minute to live, and a breath to live, what do you want to feel you have most given yourself to? Yeah. And so it's in, it's in reference to that aspiration, that calling, right? That then we can consider, is this practice I'm taking refuge in or this activity, you know, uh, uh, whatever it might be, is it a momentary pit stop that's appropriate? You know, yeah, I'm checking out for a little bit, but I'm gathering myself and I'm gonna come back into the path, right? I'm gonna keep on going. In other words, am I taking a break in order to support 
continuing to climb to ascend? Or am I taking refuge in whatever it is? Am I taking a break here or you know, getting caught up in that, frankly, in a way that stalls me out or rewards me in lesser ways, but doesn't support or en enable an opening into the highest upwellings, the, the most valued updrafts of your own life. 